<sighs> hey everybody, welcome to the G. Louise book series. I'm Skin K R I S T I N A. This is where we read book, talk about books, nothing special going on here, no special effects, anything like that. I'd appreciate the likes and subscribes. I don't know what's going on lately. Um, my Star Trek videos used to be a highlight for me for the week. I, they would always get um, double digits in views. They were consistent. Even the bad ones got 20 or 30 views. Some of the good ones got a couple of hundred views. Not likes, but views. And even if it was only for 10 seconds, someone viewed it. Um, the past month, nobody has been watching any of the episodes. I'm really depressed about that. And I'm like, should I continue? Is it just that these are dud episodes? The, the one with Riker falling all over Crusher and stuff like that. It just, I don't know what's going on. It's, it's just, you know, if you watch my videos, um, you know that by, you need to fill in the sentence and make it whatever you want. It's just, and you can feel just bad, just good, just horrible. Don't know. But anyway, we are in the end of season four, disc seven. Episode 199, that means I've done 99 of these videos, and the last five have tanked six ways to Sunday. I do not know what's going on, but we are getting ready for a two-parter next week, so I hope you'll be there for that and here for this. We are doing In Theory today, and next week we'll do Redemption Part 1. I don't know what's going on here. I thought I had y'all support. Maybe the episodes are just bad. But, uh, so this is In Theory, episode 199. And we start with an overview from the captain. The Enterprise is preparing to enter the Ma Oscura, an unexplored dark matter nebula. Commander Data is modifying several proton torpedoes for an experiment designed to elicit more information about this unusual phenomenon. So... There's a couple of things in this episode that bother the crap out of me. This is one of the things that bothers the crap out of me. But we will get to it. But I will have to remind you all of Tasha Yar. This episode seems to have forgotten about Tasha Yar. But we will go there. So Data is in the Torpedo Bay. The initial dispersal pattern should not be more than seven kilometers in diameter. This is Jenna, and she's like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 6.8 kilometers. Data says, that should suffice. Is there something occupying your thoughts? And she's like, takes a minute, and he's like, Jenna. And he says, you seem somewhat subdued today. And Jenna says, I bumped into Jeff again in the turbo lifts this morning. He asked me to dinner. What was your response? Jenna says, I told him I'd think about it. Jenna says, as you requested, I will remind you now of the reasons you decided to end your relationship with Jeff. Jenna says, I guess I asked for this. Go ahead. Jenna says, you rejected, objected to the fact that he seemed, un, seemed unwilling to set aside sufficient time for you. You said he was unresponsive, that he never did little things. You just liked the sound he made when he ate soup. Okay, okay, I remember. Jada says, this is the third time I refreshed your memory. Do you wish to rescind our agreement? Jenna's like, no, 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 it's good. It's for my own good. It's just easy to forget. Hand me the sequencer. Jada says, throughout history, many lovers have su suffered the same difficulty. Anne Boleyn was quite distressed that Henry VIII preferred the company of his huntsmen over that of his wife. Ahem. Ahem. Jenna sends... Jenna says, since when did you develop an interest in romantic historical figures? Jenna says, six weeks ago when you and Jeff dissolved your relationship. 
I saw an excellent opportunity to study the that aspect of human intimacy. As your friend, it is my responsibility to be supportive in times of need. Janice says, that's very sweet. And then um, David calls the bridge and says, they're ready. So then they launch the torpedo and it gets all pretty. And then we come back after opening credits and we're still missing the Wesley Crusher space. Where the Wesley Crusher name goes, I'm wondering, I'm just hypothetically speaking here because I don't know because I haven't watched it yet, if that little space will become Bajoran. Will it become Bajoran or just will it stay empty? Or will Kalamini take that space? I know Deep Space Nine gets started soon too, but anyways. So they're all playing music. Jenna, Data, and Kiko. Playing nice little music. They get a little bit of a poisy poisy. Um, so O'Brien greets Kiko and says that was wonderful. And they embrace and hug and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, Jenna's sitting there feeling sorry for herself and all in herself. And she's feeling down. And she's like, my tempo was off. I felt like I was rushing through the whole piece. Data says, I do not believe that is so. Your rhythmic control has improved markedly. I heard no fluctuations during the performance. Jenna says, well, maybe I ruined the coda. I got confused with the phrasing again. I kept breathing at the wrong time. Data says, the contractual nature of the composition is most to many. We will give more attention to the rhythmic patterns at your next rehearsal. However, I am quite certain the audience was oblivious to such nuances. They seem to enjoy it enjoy the performance thoroughly the audience couldn't tell i couldn't tell who could tell and i want to know were they really playing or was that you know were they were just going through the motions doing a manili really does anybody know were they really playing did they really play those two or three lines of music do we know just a thought So then, we're on a double date. Miles and Kiko and Data and Jenna were in front, 10 forward on a double date. And Kiko is spilling the tea on O'Brien. Giving that couple gossip that men really don't want other people to know about. That's personal. Of course, Data, I mean, Data really doesn't care. Um, but uh, so I think Jenna appreciates the little sharing of information. Um, so she's talking about O'Brien leaving his socks on the floor and how the first couple of nights she picked it up. And then, then she decided, you know what, if I keep doing this, I'll be doing this forever. So let me leave the stuff on the floor and maybe he'll get the hint and pick it up himself. And she waits over 10 days, and he's still not picking it up, so she picks it up. And she tells this cute little story, and Jenna appreciates it. And then they reciprocate by telling the story of Data picking up Jenna's clothes. It's a give and take thingy here. It's relationships. It's a double date. But I'd also like to point out, I should have backed up a little bit, but Kiko is hanging on to O'Brien's arm, so Jenna is hanging on to Data's arm, you know, like she, he's her boyfriend, and she's considering him as a boyfriend. And we will get into that a little later. Okay, so we're on the bridge. Picard says, report Mr. Data. Data says, I'm nearly finished compiling readings from our most recent illuminary burst. Dark matter density is nearly one order of magnitude higher than in similar nebula. Life forms that may be developed in ways never before observed. Interesting hypothesis, Riker says. Are there any M-class planets we could check out? Data says, several, sir. The nearest is approximately three light hours from our present position. 
Picard says it's worth a look. We'll continue our survey along the way. You know, you don't understand what this is all about until later, but the the medical equipment had fallen on the floor as Beverly walked by, so she bent down to pick it up. And we we don't get the context of this until much later. It takes them a really long time to explain what's going on. And they don't make it seem all that important until it becomes massively important. So then we're in the torpedo bay again. And Jenna is telling him about her childhood, growing up. They didn't have much money. And I'm trying to think now. I thought they relied on the barter system in this century. I thought they didn't have money problems in this century. So I'm not sure what this was all about. I thought, you know, these people don't actually get paid. It, they're in Starfleet. They get clothing and stuff, and they use the replicator. And do, I mean, they say that there's no money. We have that big thing with those people from the 20th century. And we're like, the banks don't exist, and um, we're doing the barter system now, or uh, it's free. So I'm not sure what she's talking about here with uh, her, uh, her childhood, her mother lacking money, and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't make sense for this time period. So I'm a little confused. So if anybody is still watching this, please let me know. But she's um she says sometimes in the summer we'd go on cookouts, just my little brother, me and my mother. She was hopeless without a replicator. We didn't care. Daddy says children often do not develop discerning palates until well beyond adolescence. Jenna says it wasn't that, it was just that we felt so good being together. You know, as a family we didn't have much of that after my father died. So those times were really special. So again, this is what I'm talking about. I thought we didn't have money problems in this century. So what's up with that? Anybody know? So they do this little bonding thing. They go back and forth. She's spilling her guts to him. She's falling in love with him. And then she, she kisses him on the cheek just before she leaves. And then she thinks about it again, and then she kisses him full on the lips. And Data's like, hmm. So then Data goes into 10-4, and Gaida is making this drink. And she says, hello, Data, would you like to try something new? It's a concoction I heard about at Pralaka 2. I think it's wonderful, but I need a second opinion. So then Data takes a sip. And... Excuse me, he's a computer. Computers don't drink liquids. Explain this to me. Where does that liquid go when it goes in data? He's, he's an android. He's supposed to be a robot. Somebody tell me where the liquid went. Because he's, he's a computer. He doesn't require food. He doesn't need food. I, I want to know where the liquid goes. It's just going to sit in his insides. There's acid in there. If there's sugar and, uh, and alcohol, it's going to eat his wires out and stuff, right? It's going to irritate the wires. So I don't understand why the hell he's drinking this stuff. Why do they always throw this stuff in? He's supposed to be a robot. He's not supposed to drink or eat. This stuff is going to uh, irritate his wires. So um, he, then he analyzes the thing and gives her a whole bunch of technical terms. And Guinan's like, too sweet, Data? If I didn't know you better, I'd say you were a little preoccupied. Data says, Lieutenant DeSura just gave me what can be considered a very passionate kiss in the torpedo bay. Guinan says, really? And I was intrigued. Jenna seemed to be displaying genuine affection for me. Well, what do you think of her, Data? I find her to be a competent officer, highly motivated, though somewhat lacking in her understanding of the theory underlying the Dilithium Matrix application. Guinan says, I met personally. Data says, I look forward to the time we spend together. 
Guy says, well, then it seems the next move is yours. What are you going to do? Jada says, I don't know. I have no experience in such matters. I require advice. Guinan says, don't look at me. And Data looks away. And she's like, no, 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 Data. I, I simply meant that I can't give you any advice here. It's not good to advise people about their first love affairs. That's the kind of thing they have to figure out for themselves. Data says, but I'm not capable of love. Guinan says, then that's going to make be a very unique experience. And I would like to bring up my beef again. Tasha Yar, y'all! Tasha Yar! Data had a thing with her. I had physical relationship. He's got a hologram figure of her in his desk. Excuse me, Tasha Yar! I'm just saying. Forge approaches Data in the hallway and says he found Spot two corridor sections away. And Data's like, did you leave the door open? And Data says the door sensor is programmed to recognize only humanoid forms for entry and egress. Spot should not have triggered the mechanism. And they go into uh, Data's quarters. The Forge says maybe someone came in while you were away. Let them out. Let them out by accident. Has anything been disturbed? Data says, it does not appear so. Computer, has anyone been in my quarters in the last 12 hours other than Commander LaForge and myself? Computer says, negative. LaForge says, that's really strange. You know, to be on the safe side, maybe I should report a possible unauthorized entry to security. Data says, Jordy, may I ask your advice in a personal matter? Sure, Data. Data says, should I pursue a relationship with Lieutenant DeSora? LaForge said, I thought she and Janet after him. Data says they've discontinued their association. She has made the first move in, in, in initiating a relationship with me. What should I do? She's coming out of a bad situation, you know. Sometimes it takes a while, people a while, Data. But then if they jump right into another relationship, you know, you see, that can be trouble. On the rebound. Rebound relationships never work. Unless, of course, she's really ready. Then I guess it depends on whether or not you're really serious. This can be a little complicated. Listen, my advice is ask somebody else for advice. At least somebody else who's got more experience at giving advice. Somebody else who's good at giving advice. Troy! So we go see Troy. And she's like, I think you should be careful. This isn't just some experiment you're running data. Jenna is a living, breathing person with needs and feelings that have to be considered. Jenna says, then you do not believe I should pursue this any further. Troy says, I didn't say that. I just want you to be aware that this is unlike any other more casual relationship than you've attempted. Jenna says, I have studied much human literature on the subject of love and romantic liaisons. There are many role models for me to emulate. Troy says, ultimately, Jenna will care for you for what you are, not what you in intimidate out of a book. My, Data says, my programming may be inadequate to the task. Troy says, we're all more than the sum of our parts, Data. You'll have to be more than the sum of your programming. And then he does something really weird. Then he goes, ask war for relationship. And I think the very last person on Earth, or on the Enterprise, should I say, that you should ask for relationship advice is war. Because Cleons do it a whole different way. They're very violent and physical and biting and aggressive and attacking and going after stuff they want. They're not humans. Although they are, but they're not. And uh, Worf says, Klingons do not pursue relationships. They conquer that which they desire. However, Lieutenant Desora serves under my command, so if she were mistreated, I would be displeased. Supposed to be cute, I think. So then, Data goes to Don Juan of the Enterprise, who should be in a relationship with Troy and no one else, but the writers want to kill us with giving Troy and him other relationships. And I know eventually in the series someplace, Troy gets with uh, Worf. 
I don't know how far they get, but they do. She does get with him a little bit. And I just, I just, the whole thing is just wrong. And the fact that we have to wait till a movie for something to happen really sucks too. So, um, Riker says, I think you should pursue it. First of all, she's a beautiful woman. She seems to be crazy about you. And Troy is crazy about you too, Mr. Riker. Dennis says, Jenna has clearly demonstrated how she feels about me, but I am not capable of returning those feelings. Well, duh. He does feel, though. I believe Data does feel a little bit. Um... Data, when you get involved with another person, there are always risks of disappointment of getting hurt. I cannot be hurt, but she can. Jenna knows that, and she's obviously decided to take the chance, Data. But when it when it really works between two people, it's not like anything you've ever experienced before. The rewards are far beyond simple friendship. Well, why aren't you with Miss Troy, Mr. Riker? Hmm, ha, hmm. Data, how far, sir? That's what I'm hoping you're going to find out. Thank you, Commander. We have two extras sitting at the helm today. Woohoo! It's rare that we get two extras sitting at the helm. Um, and then Data comes in and he approaches Picard and uh, Cap. He, Data says, Captain, I'm seeking advice in how, and Picard's like, <clears throat> I've heard. I would be delighted to offer any advice I can on understanding women when I have some. Then he puts a halt to it right away, doesn't feel comfortable with it at all. So apparently it's date night. And Data brings her flowers. And she, when they pan back from the room, they show several vases. So instead of going over to the replicator and replicating a new vase, she takes out flowers from one vase, throws them here, and puts the flowers in the vase, and then sets it on the table. So they discuss the flowers. Then um, she's sitting on the chair and uh, Riker, Data says, Commander Riker suggested this flower. He, sa he said it worked for him in the past. Um, Data held his arms like this. Jenna's like, uh, you didn't talk to the whole ship about us. He's like, uh-huh. That's exactly what he did. He asked the entire ship for advice. No, in actuality, less than 1% of the Enterprise crew was involved. It was necessary to balance theory with exper experimental references. Both are required for a program of this nature. Computer degrees elimination by one-third standard lux. And he dims the lights, and he puts her on the couch, and he's going to rub her feet in. And um, uh, She's like, so I'm just a small variable in one of your new computational environments? Jenna says, you are much more than that, Jenna. I have written a subroutine specifically for you, a program within the program. I have devoted a considerable share of my internal resources to its development. And they kiss a little bit, and then we're back on the bridge. I guess we're supposed to assume that something else happened here, but I don't want to assume something else happened here. And if data isn't if data isn't human and I know he pleased Tasha Yar, we were led to believe that he himself experienced some kind of fulfillment when he was with Tasha Yar. Go back and watch that episode and he's got all those facial expressions. So we're led to believe he experienced something. So I want to know, does Data experience a thing, an explosion, shall we say? Because he's a machine, so he's he shouldn't be capable of all that stuff, right? 
So I, I, it just, it's just too much to think about. It's just unpleasant to think about. Do you want a, do you want a person in your bed or do you want a computer in your bed? Although I have a computer in my bed. <laughs> I play games. Computer games. Word search. What do you play? We have another incident of something not explained. Um, his computer stuff is on the floor in pieces. So he calls Worf in, Worf scans it, finds that the only person that's touched it is him. And Picard tries to make light of it by saying they have a poltergeist and Worf looks like him, like he's got screws in his head, like, huh? Worf has no idea what a poltergeist is. So then, um, she brings, she brings Data a piece of artwork, and he puts it down, and she's like, and she gives him a look, and he's putting it in place where the light would be the best for it to show it off. She makes the face, so then he puts it on the table. They have all this relationship talk. It's just like, uh huh. I just. It's just, it's just, and then she tells him to go back to painting, so he goes back to painting, but she really didn't mean that, and it has this whole relationship angst going on, and if you've been with me with my books, um, or my flashback Mondays, mean, unless there's a mystery, unless there's a vampire thing going on, Unless there's a mystery and the people form the relationship while solving the mystery. But for uh, just a relationship thing, uh, just I don't do contemporary relationship angst. It's just, I just, uh, give me a mystery and a little relationship on the side. My J.D. Robb, we have progressional growth, we have love interest going on, but we also have a murder mystery going on. We're solving a murder mystery. Even in Patterson's Murder Club, Boxer and Joe, and uh, all the, the Claire and Yuki, and the, they get in relationships, but there's still a mystery going on while we're solving the thing, and the relationships are progressing. But we still have a relationships going on, a mystery going on, and solving a crime going on. It's just not just the relationship. I don't want just the relationship. And all this angst made me so uncomfortable. Because Dana's a computer! Just saying. So then they get to the planet and it's not there. And then after a few minutes of uh, calculations and scans, the planet appears. Um, Picard says, Mr. Data running full systems diagnostic. Computer says, warning, atmospheric decompression in bridge observation lounge. I invent a compensation sequence being initiated. Worf says, I'm not registering a hull bridge. Picard says, scan for life forms. Worf says, none. Cap Data says, Captain, standard air pressure has been reestablished in the observation lounge. Picard says, let's go have a look. See, it's not there. And then you look back at them. And there it is. It's back. And then they go look at the observation lounge and all the furniture is piled up by the window. So then, Ada's trying to be romantic 
Uh, and I just, I just don't need all this in the episode. I want to go back to what's, bo- what's going on. I want to go back to the sci-fi stuff. I want to go back to what's going on with the entity, what's happening to the ship. I want to go back to the sci-fi. I've had enough of this right now. We're being overwhelmed with too much relationship angst. And you know it's not going to last. He's a computer! I mean, he comes in and, Hi, honey, I'm home! And she's like, hi! And she's like, any luck with your diagnostic? And he goes, no. And we did a security sweep, and she, he makes the, the drinks with the, the little cherry things. And um, she's very tired. He starts picking up her clothes. She's like, would you don't do that? So he just drops it all. And they have this this discussion, and he's like, am I not paying attention to you enough? Um, Your hair is looking particularly silky tonight, and Data, there's just something strange about the way you're acting. And he goes, I am not behaving as a solicitous mate. Well, yeah, but tending to every need, what's wrong with you? And he's like, well, he's, he's implemented some new stuff into his program to accentuate for her. He's made all these changes to his program for her. It's just, it's just too much for me to handle. So if you don't mind, we'll just skip this part. It's just this. Oh, I also wanted to point out something. She's blonde and she looks like Tasha. Yeah, did they do that on purpose? It was just a thought. Okay, then we're back to some sci-fi stuff. Riker says a complete sensor scan of the planet and three survey probes turned up no surprises, no signs of life, nothing out of the ordinary. Worf says seven more unusual incidents have been reported, no casualties or damage. Data says we can only state that a subspace effect seems to exist within this nebula. After I've made further analysis, I may be able to adjust the ship's sensors to locate and identify the anomaly. Riker says the ship is at risk as long as we sit here. We could continue the investigation outside the nebula. Agreed. Ensign McKnight. And here we go. The chick is an ensign, and she's got a name, and she's got a line. I've made this a big thing in my thing, but she's got a line. And she's on camera a few times. There she is, our Enfig McKnight. And she's alone. We don't see somebody next to her. Okay, then we're in engineering. The Ford says, we're showing damage between decks. We haven't localized it yet. They had this little thing happen on the bridge. Um, energy travels across the wall panel, and he throws the crewman to the floor. He knocks him, you know, stun guns him, electrifies him a little bit, but he's okay. So, um, the forge says to the bridge, the cyogenic control conduit just blew out on us. And he lost, he almost lost a man. So they come to full stop, and they go to investigate. My pal is going off. Bing, bing. 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 Okay, she's finished. So, um, the, he tells the uh, bridge that he almost lost a man, and because it's full stop, McKnight says, I, the forge to bridge, go ahead, Commander. I think we have some structural damage between 36 and 37. I'd better go check it out. And he goes to check it out. They're in the hallway, and he says, you go this way, we'll go that way. Mistake! So, was this necessary? Did we have to, did we have to have a violent death? Was this a, was this one of those unnecessary things that had to happen? Why, why did we have to have someone die? Why did we have a senseless death? If it was fighting and battle, defending planet, if there was a disease going on, if there's something with the whole crew. But I there was no reason for this. 
there was seriously no reason to kill somebody like this. Very unnecessary. Very um, useless. I don't think it was right. It, it, it really wasn't right doing this. So then we're in the observation lounge, and Data is explaining to everybody. During the last occurrence, I was able to confirm one of my hypotheses. The unusual preponderance of dark matter in this nebula is causing small gaps in the fabric of normal space. As the Enterprise moves to the nebula, it is colliding with these de deformations. Look forward to so every time we hit one part of the ship momentarily phases out of normal space. Or when one of them hits us, my reading suggests that the deformations themselves are in motion. It's a good thing one of those pockets didn't pass through a photon torpedo, Riker says, or causing the matter-antimatter containment pods. Picard asks, the question is, how do we get out, Mr. Data? Can you reconfigure the sensors to detect these anomalies? Yes, sir, but only at extremely close range. Even at minimal speed, it would almost be impossible to maneuver the Enterprise quickly enough to avoid them. Warp says the shuttlecraft could do it. Riker says he's right. We could position the shuttlecraft far enough in front of the Enterprise. It could detect the pockets and allow us time to maneuver out of the way. The Ford says we could give the shuttle control of our navigational systems. That way, the corresponding maneuvers would be virtually instantaneous. Picard says make it so. And then we're back on the bridge. Riker plans on being the one doing the shuttlecraft thingy, and Picard's like, no, 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 me, 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 me. I'm the one with the fancy driving skills. I'm going to go do it, because I did that driving thing when I was a kid. Remember all those stories we heard about me and Mr. Crusher, um, Wesley's dad, with the driving bit in the shuttle and maneuvering and all that kind of stuff? So he's... Picard has decided that he's going to be the one to go in the shuttle and drive. And um, Riker's like, it's my duty as first officer to safeguard the lives on this ship, including yours, Captain. The Enterprise can't afford to lose you. And Picard's like, nope, gonna do it. My sail. And he does it. Him sail. Here we have our little shuttlecraft. Outside the Enterprise, all nice and pretty with blue lights. And Picard inside the shuttle doing his stuff. Um, Picard says, shuttle 3 to Enterprise, telemetry link enabled. Data says, ship's computer is accepting navigational inputs from the shuttle. Picard says, forward sensors are online. Ensign McKnight plotted course for the shortest distance out of the nebula. McKnight says, plot laid in. And then we switch back to the bridge. Outer perimeter at 32 million kilometers. Picard said 1.1 1. 1 impulse to number one. Riker says acknowledge. We're right behind you. Riker to O'Brien. Lock on the captain's communicator. And then we see O'Brien and he says, yeah, I'm locked on. And Data says maintaining main coupling is matching navigational inputs, Captain. McKnight says new heading confirmed. Picard says I missed it by less than 1,000 meters, Enterprise. Advise your status. Worf says, sensors indicate deformation passing 500 meters off the starbound. Cap Riker says, one down, Captain. Picard says, resuming previous course. Confirmed. Outer perimeter now at 30.1 million kilometers. Picard says, changing course, 03073, mark 288. Um, Picard says, new heading, 284, mark 013. Not quick enough. Enterprise, I'm losing maneuverability. LaForge, sensors indicate... Damage to the shuttle's starboard impulse nacelle, Captain. Picard says, I'm rewriting this secondary nebula, switching to manual control. And then we're back down on the bridge again. Um, transceiver signal is down 42%. Navigational inputs are not registering. Captain, we've lost our link to you. We've lost you. So then the shuttle, um, command, Data says, Commander, the shuttle is out of control. Riker says, Mr. O'Brien, do you have the captain signal? O'Brien says, I'm having trouble locking on, sir. Always oh, a little suspense! Always oh, a little suspense! Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! Like you know. Like you know he's fine. 
This is only the end of season four. We've got a few more seasons to go yet. We've got some movies to go yet. We got some Borg to go yet. Ah, uh, Data says the shuttle's inertial dampeners have failed. It's breaking up. Riker says get him out of there. They get him out. Um, they get him out and Picard says he's a little dizzy, but he's okay. Um, Data says, Commander, we are nearing the perimeter, one million kilometers, and, uh, they get out, and then we gotta have some more relationship angst. The old wake up. We got some candles, we got some romantic lighting, she comes in, and... Um, she says, uh, the place looks great. Dada says, it, it's much less Spartan, is it not? Jenna says, yes, it looks great. Jenna says, you're repeating, says, you're repeating stuff. I have often found this to be indicative of mental distraction. Is that a correct assumption in this instance? Jenna says, I'm afraid it is. Dada says, then perhaps we should begin our meal. Among humans, a low serum glucose level is often responsible for Jenna says, Dede, I think we should talk. Could you sit down? I'm not sure how to begin. What is the subject? You and I, our relationship. Dede says, yes. Jenna says, Dede, sometimes people blindly make the same mistake again and again. Are you currently experiencing this phenomena? Jenna says, I didn't see it until today. I got out of relationship with an un unemotional man, and I got right back into it with another man who is absolutely incapable of motion. There does seem to be a recurring motif, Dede says. Uh, Jenna says, you're so kind and attentive. I thought that would be enough. Data says, it's not. She says, no, it's not. Because as close as we are, I don't really matter to you. Not really. Nothing I say or do will ever make you happy or sad or touch you in any way. Data says, that is a valid point. It's apparent that my reach has exceeded my grasp in this particular area. I am perhaps not nearly so human as I aspire to become. If you are ready to eat, I will bring out our meal. And why is he eating? He's a computer. Why is he eating? He's a computer. Why is he eating? The liquid and the stuff is going to kill his internal circuitry, right? He's got internal circuitry. They open him up. He's got internal circuitry. What is he doing with food? So, um, she's like, um, as you wish, Jenna, are we no longer a couple? Jenna says, no, we are not. Data says, then I will delete the appropriate program. Jenna says, I will see you later. He just deletes the program. That's it. It's all over. He just deletes the program. Ping. Click your mouse. It's over. She leaves. And he sits down with the cat. That's it. The end. Being a cat lover, I just thought I'd show the cat. I need a cute little kitty, kitty, kitty. So, that's the end of In Theory. I hope you enjoyed my little connotation. And, uh, I hope you will join me next week when we do Redemption Part 1. I hope you will tune in for my daily book reviews and Flashback Monday and my new series in March, If Then. If you like this, maybe you'll like this book. If you like the Briggertons, maybe you'll like the Mallorys and the Sherbrooks and the other people I bring up. If you're into medicals, if you like Patricia Cornwell, maybe you'll like this one or this one or this one. So please come and check out those for March. I've got a lot of stuff going on in March. So please have a good day. And uh, please hit the like and subscribe. I hope you made it all the way through. I hope I figure out what's wrong with these Star Trek videos. Like I said in the beginning, um, they've lost everything. I don't know what's going on with the analytics or whatever. But these videos used to get some views. Now they're getting no views. And I don't know what's going on. 
But I appreciate you being here. If you are still here, please hit the like and subscribe. Let me know I'm doing a good job. Thank you so much for being here.